As artificial intelligence quickly reshapes business, tech companies are working to create better AI chips to drive innovation. An example of that innovation is Sci-5, a company that's a pioneering force behind the RISC-V chip architecture. I'm James McGuire, this is Tech Voices, and joining me today is Krista Asanovich, co-founder and chief architect at Sci-5, to talk about how RISC-V is supporting today's AI workloads. Krista, really good to have you with us today. Yeah, thanks, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for taking uh, the time. Sure. So for those who aren't as familiar with the company, what do people need to know about Sci-5? What's the main focus? Yeah, so Sci-5, we were founded just over 10 years ago now. We just celebrated our 10th birthday. Mm -hmm. And uh, the team that founded Sci-5 is myself, Andrew Waterman, Yensup Lee. And we were the folks at Berkeley who uh, basically created RISC-V. And so when we started Sci-5, our goal was to you know, help the commercial uh, development of RISC-V and actually get it out there into industry. And so Sci-Fi right now, we've been going for 10 years, um, uh, now roughly 500 people spread across the world, um, wow. okay. supporting, working with most of the top semiconductor makers, uh, supplying IP to them. Uh -huh. All right, so let's talk about the new release. Uh, so Sci-Fi has launched a new RISC-V design to accelerate AI workloads. What's important about this launch? Uh, how does it make a difference for artificial intelligence? Uh, so first thing to say, this is the second generation of what we call our intelligence line. Mm -hmm. So this new launch builds upon the experience we'd have over the last few years with our first generation products where we had over 40 design wins. And so listening to our customers, figuring out the features we need to add to improve things. So we've done a lot of uh, development improvement based on that experience. Um, I think the most important uh, new feature here is a new member of the family. Um, speaking to our customers, one of their common use cases was using our core next to their own custom acceleration logic. And one of the requests was, can we have a much smaller core? And so we've attacked that with the new X160, X180 processors, which are very small variants of our existing family. So improvements for all the family, but also this new smaller member of the family is probably the highlight of this next launch. What, what, what's the advantage of the smaller core? Um, a lot of the customers are just using AI in the edge and they, have, they want a very efficient, um, very easy to use core that they can place next to all kinds of accelerators. So AI is one of the dominant use cases, but there are many other kinds of accelerator. And the customers like to move to a more uniform model where they have a standard way of connecting any kind of accelerator into their SLC. And so these small cores are a very um, efficient way of doing that. So that's the new launch. What are some key features that people really need to know about? Yeah, so based on this experience we had the first generation, we made a bunch of improvements to the whole family, of course. Uh, one of the key things is a new uh, what we call SSCI, Sci-5 Scalar Coprocessor Interface. We already had a vector coprocessor interface that allowed people to connect their accelerator directly to the vector register file, so very high data throughput. Um, but folks also wanted a scalar coprocessor interface that allows scalar register values to be communicated along with custom instructions to the accelerator for control functions. So this SSCI feature is now available across, across the family. Um, We've also made a bunch of improvements to the memory system, which is very critical for AI applications. So we've uh, made the configurations, the multi-core configurations more efficient in terms of the, how the memory hierarchy is organized. And we've also added even deeper latency tolerance so we can handle full bandwidth out to memory that may be 100 or 200 more cycles away uh, from the processor. Um, and finally, we've added uh, a lot of new instructions uh, to help accelerate key pieces of AI algorithms. Uh, one example is we've added a fully pipelined exponential functional unit uh, that can provide very high throughput for exponential functions, which are a key component of many of the new activation functions being used in AI applications. I'm wondering how you see sci-fi fit into the larger market. I mean, how do you compare sci-fi's AI chip designs with GPU-centric approaches in terms of efficiency, flexibility? I mean, obviously, GPUs get a lot of headlines these days. I mean, how does sci-fi fit into that world? Well, the first thing to understand is uh, Sci-5 is an IP provider. So we provide IP designs. We're not a, a chip manufacturer or a right. chip uh, semiconductor company. We provide yep. IP. And so this allows our customers to build their own SOC or chip using our IP and combining it with the other functions they need for some market domain. Um, so you can customize a single chip design, uh, including our IP, other functionality. Um, now, how we differ from GPUs in terms of architecture, so that's a change in the business model. We're, we're supplying IP, not silicon. Mm -hmm. Another sure. difference is that the Sci-5 cores, we rely on RISC-V, the open standard uh, architecture is the basis for our AI processing. So this means there's a very general purpose software stack supported on top of this. 
Um, but to that, we have the efficient vector support in the intelligence family. And we've also added matrix support in the intelligence family. So we can get the compute densities and efficiencies of the GPU, but with a more standard software programming environment underneath it. Uh huh. All right. Well, let's talk about open standards because that's it's really a big part of what the story here. I mean, how do open standards change the competitive dynamics of the semiconductor industry? Well, the important thing is, you know, if you look at the, the way the industry is being structured, the proprietary instruction sets kind of lock you into a single vendor. Uh, sure. That design. Right. Uh, the open standard allows customers to shop amongst competitors. So in a given kind of socket, like a given kind of processor, there'll be competition so you can get to pick the best one. I think the other important aspect is there can be vendors who supply a range of different versions of RISC-V for different applications. You have a much broader uh, set of offerings coming from different vendors attacking different use cases. You know, Sci-Fi, we have one of the broadest portfolios, um, everything from small microcontrollers all the way up to high-performance application processes. But with the open standard, it really opens a space for many competitors, many vendors to come in and offer a much wider variety that you could possibly get from a single uh, vendor. So certainly openness will accelerate innovation, but some people say that openness adds to fragmentation. What's your take on that? Well, RISC-V, we've designed a very flexible instruction set. So one aspect of the ISA is, yes, you can customize and modularize the, the pieces to only include the pieces you need, which people worry causes fragmentation. But in domains where fragmentation is a big issue, for example, where you're supporting a large binary software ecosystem, at RISC-V, the community has got together and um, built these things we call profiles, the ISA profiles. So RVA23 is the one we just uh, ratified last October. And this is becoming very important in the RISC-V community as this is a standard that all the different vendors of application processors have agreed to support. And so all the software vendors are now agreed to target this one. So we made a very conscious effort across all the providers to avoid this fragmentation problem. It actually is a bigger problem for the other ISAs. Um, then that's at the application processor level. Um, but I think there's a very different kind of fragmentation people don't often talk about, which is at the SOC level, when you're building a chip and you're including lots of IPs from different places, um, a lot of those IPs have different instruction sets. And if you wonder why is that, why do we have so many different instruction sets on a chip? It's because previous to RISC-5, there wasn't an open standard everybody could use. So the main application processor may be a proprietary ISA from one vendor, and they wouldn't allow others to sublicense it. So anybody building a different IP block or accelerator, they'd have to build their own instruction set. And you multiply this many times and you end up with many different instruction sets running together on one chip. And this is a bit of a nightmare for the software developers, obviously. Now with RISC-V, instead, each of those IP blocks can use RISC-V as the base instruction set and uh -huh. they've got their own custom extensions. And so now the whole SOC has a very uniform software environment. And where this is really critical is supporting this software tool chains. Instead of having a very fragmented market where the software effort for a single IP block there's only a small amount of effort you can justify. So the software tool chain won't be as good. Now everything is using the same RISC-V tool chain. There's more investment in that one tool chain, better debuggers, better tracing facilities, better compilers, better everything, because uh, unified support. Um, you know, in Sci-Fi, actually, the intelligence series is designed for this, the second use case very carefully because we want to uh, provide our intelligence cores as the, the front end to these custom accelerators. So we're giving the customer a standard RISC-V front end to which they can attach their custom engines that help support removing this SLC balkanization that existed already. Well, let's talk about edge computing. It's a huge opportunity. AI at the edge requires ultra low power, compact power and high efficiency. How is Sci-5 targeting this space? Yeah, one thing is in our intelligence family, we provide a range of different uh, members of sizes of the, the cores, like different performance levels. Like I said, we just introduced this new very low end member of the intelligence family that has quite significant AI capability, even though it's a small core. But you can scale this up to our very largest XM member of the family, which is a large matrix acceleration unit, and which can be arrayed so you can have many of these on a die. So the, the customer can choose what level of AI they need in their specific application for their SLC. Um, the, the second way we help is providing our cores uh, as a companion cores. So next to the customer's own choice of accelerators, they can design their own accelerator, size that to their needs but then have our standard core on the front of it, um, providing a standard RISC-V software environment for the, the rest of the SOC. Mm -hmm. Well, what's a use case, uh, an edge application where Sci-5 is already deployed or where would you commonly be used? 
Uh, some of the use cases we're, we're seeing are in um, automobiles, so EVs. Um, so in fact, our intelligence calls will be on the road in a production EV next year, mm -hmm. um, helping with the ADAS functions inside that um, EV. Cool. Um, we're also being used in a bunch of industrial applications. Um, another uh, highlight application is NASA selected uh, the first generation of our intelligence cores to form the basis of the high-performance space computer. Wow. HPSC with our partners, Microchip, uh, this will now be the standard high-performance computing platform for all space missions from NASA. Um, and that's that's based on our first generation intelligence cores. So that's really out on the edge, the far right. <laughs> that is really out of the edge. That's great. All right, let's look at the future. I think it's where the tech market always wants to look. I mean, fast forward a few years down the line, how do you see the balance between custom AI accelerators and general purpose AI processors evolving? And, and where will Sci-5 be in that landscape as you see it? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a classic um, cycle of uh, innovation that happens with new algorithms in the architecture world. Over many decades, we see this cycle repeated. So initially, there's a heavy compute demand. People build more custom acceleration logic. But then as it becomes used more and more, people realize, well, A, they need the software to be more general, and you want to use it in many different applications. Uh, but B, you also, people start to understand what are the key attributes of that accelerator that allowed it to be more efficient. And then you figure out how to graph that onto a more general architecture. So then you can retain the benefit of having a general programmable architecture while having the efficient primitives for supporting the uh, this use case. So for example, the work in RISC V on vector and matrix extensions, those really capture the, uh, the the key properties you need to make an efficient implementation. So you don't have to sacrifice a general purpose programming environment to get the efficiency you need to run these um, at scale. Hmm. That's what I think. So I think things will move to a more general uh, architecture, but that general architecture will have this extensive support for the key pieces of those AI algorithms. All right, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Krista, you, it's a lot of good stuff. And anything you'd like to say in closing about uh, Sci-5 or the RISC-V market? Um, well, the RISC-V market, like we like to say, RISC-V is inevitable. Like we talked to lots of folks and everybody's moving everything to RISC-V over time. It different sectors goes at different speeds. Um, and so, you know, just stay tuned as we, you know, uh, venture into more markets. Are you talking about a RISC-V? Is there going to be a risk 6 some year in the future? Uh, so people often ask me about that. I think what people have to understand, no, there won't be a risk six. For the same reason, there won't be something after Ethernet. Every time there is a good idea, a new idea in technology, uh, whether it's instruction sets or networking, because there's a powerful open standard already, what people want to do is bring that new feature into the existing open standard. So what you see is any new idea that people may think they want to do risk six for, what will actually happen, it will get forwarded into a future iteration of risk five. Mm -hmm. So really, it's, it's about the, the power and the value of open standards. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So everybody wants an open standard, and they're highly motivated to stay with an open standard and keep backwards compatible with all the infrastructure they built already. Mm -hmm. Krista, I think you said it. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your expertise, and please come back and talk with us again sometime. Great. Love to come back. Thanks.